All right, so let's talk about the preconditions of intelligibility. Okay, so we've talked about A, I, arbitrary and destiny consistency, and now we're talking about P, the P, preconditions of intelligibility, the preconditions for knowledge. These are the things that make knowledge possible. Okay? What are they? Okay, so let's talk about them each in their turn. Let's talk about, I think, what's the easiest one to understand, which is universal objective ethics. Okay? So when something is said to be universal, what does that mean? True. Everywhere. True everywhere. Okay. When it's something is said to be objective, what does that mean? Yeah, so you're you're thinking I think subjective, which is dependent upon the person. Objective is the opposite of that, which is true regardless of what people's opinions are, okay? Not based on personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. So object so when we say that these ethics are universal, they're e everywhere, they're objective, it's not based upon what you think, it's outside of you. That's what we're saying. Universal objective ethics, that the that the laws of what are right and wrong are you true everywhere for every person and they're not based upon personal tastes and opinions. Now when I, we use those descriptions, but what am I talking about? I'm talking about the law of God. The law of God is universal, applies to everybody, and is objective. It's not from us. It's not based upon our personal feelings and opinions. So it's anti-relativism, like we've already looked at a bit. Relativism is not a cogent way of looking at ethics. Okay, so universal objective ethics is, and it's a necessary precondition for knowledge. Why? Because everybody makes moral judgments. That's how we interact with the world. Um, it's impossible not to make moral judgments. As I mentioned before, if somebody's angry about the actions of somebody else, that's an indication that they say what they're doing is wrong, right? We all have moral judgments. So the first precondition for knowledge, something that we're talking about, is how do people know what is right and wrong? Everybody makes judgments about what's right and wrong, but how do we know what is right and wrong, right, without being arbitrary or inconsistent? So the key epistemological question here is, how do you know that it is immoral to do X, Y, and Z? How do you know it's wrong, it's morally wrong to do this? Or why do you believe it's morally wrong to do this? Okay? And what we're doing there is we're challenging the unbeliever to justify their belief in ethics, to give a reason for their belief in ethics. Okay? So let's break this down a little more. So the statement murder is wrong, is an ethical statement, right? What about this? Is the statement murder is okay? Is that an ethical statement? It is. They're contradictory opinions, but they're both ethical statements about whether murder should be done or should not be done. They're both moral statements. And they both assume some sort of moral standard, right? In this case, the moral standards are different. One says murder is wrong, one says murder is acceptable. Um, but they're both moral statements nonetheless. So what we're saying here is that non-Christian worldviews cannot justify their beliefs in morals at all, whether his moral standards agree with the Bible or not. Okay? In other words, a non-Christian cannot give a reason why anyone should live or act in a certain way. So you're going to look for those words. You should or should not do something, or you ought to do this, you ought not to do that. Those are moral words, moral indicators. They're saying what we should and should not do, what is right, what is wrong. Okay. See, the unbeliever still believes that people should conduct themselves in a certain way, right? You have your most, most base atheist, still has ethics, right? He still believes things are right and wrong, right? He may, um, for example, let's say I'm a Christian and I, oppo I oppose abortion, and this guy says abortion is, is great. They're both ethical claims, they're different ethical claims, but nevertheless, we both are appealing to some ethics. We both have morality. He may tell me, you shouldn't tell people that it's wrong, right? Well, is that a moral claim? He says, you shouldn't tell people it's wrong to have an abortion. Well, he's telling me I'm doing something wrong. I'm being immoral. 
Okay? We all have moral beliefs, regardless of the worldview. We have it. And we have different moral beliefs. Sometimes I may agree with an atheist. They may say, Hitler was wrong. And I say, I agree wholeheartedly. We may agree, or they may say, abortion's okay. And I say, I disagree wholeheartedly, right? Regardless, everybody has moral statements, or moral beliefs, rather, Right? It's inescapable. Someone may say, well, no one should judge anyone else for what they believe is right or wrong. But you can, can you see the problem with that? No one should judge what other people, no one should judge um, anyone else for what they believe is right and wrong. Well, that itself is a, is a moral statement. They should not judge others, right? So what are they doing? If you're judging others, you shouldn't do that. Well, they're judging you, right? So it's inescapable, right? We all make moral judgments. So we're looking for words like should or ought. Those are moral words, and everybody makes moral judgments, okay? So the moral standards that unbelievers use may differ from one another. Like, again, one could say murder is wrong, another could say murder is acceptable. But no unbeliever can give a reason for morality as a category in their worldview, regardless of the contents of their beliefs, right? In other words, they may say that murder is wrong, but they, can they give a reason why anything is right and wrong, including murder or theft or whatever it may be? Can they make sense of ethics being a thing, that there is a certain way that we should live and there are certain things we shouldn't do? That's the question. Can you make sense of ethics at all? We all believe ethical things. Everybody does. We don't all agree on the content of what's right and wrong, but we all believe something's right and wrong. The question is, can your worldview even make sense of ethics as a category? Does ethics, is there, is there a, a thing, is there a reason for us to live a certain way? Okay. So that is, like, in universal objective ethics, we're asking, how do you know that it's wrong to murder? Can you ask, or can you, can you give a reason for it? So let's go down this, this track just a little bit. Let me see real quick. Yeah, let's go down this, this little bit. You're talking to somebody, and you say, okay, would you agree with me? Let's, let's make it simple and say this person is just an atheist. You're talking to an atheist, and you say, "Can you, you would you agree with me that um, that school shootings are immoral?" And the atheist says, "Yes, people should not do that. That is wrong." Say, "Okay, good. I'm glad we agree on that." So what you've established there is that you agree on the content of something ethical. You both agree that school shootings are wrong. So, okay, so let me ask you this. In your worldview, why is it wrong for people to do school shootings? Okay, so you've asked the key epistemological question. You've already established you agree on the particular belief school shootings are wrong, but now you're asking him to justify that belief, to give a reason for his belief. And now your ears are pricked for arbitrariness and inconsistency. Right? Why is it wrong? Put your atheist hats on and think, how, would, how may somebody answer that question from an atheistic worldview? And that's all we know about them in this scenario. Let's just leave it at that. Somebody that is an atheist, do you know that? How might they answer? They might answer, if we keep killing the kids... There will be no kids left and our species will go extinct. Sure. They might answer that way. Okay. All right. Now, how do you respond? So they, do they, the answer is, well, if, we, if people are killing kids all the time, then we will, will die out as a human race. And remember, the question is, why is it wrong to kill students or kill children in school or whatever? How do you respond to that answer? We'll die out if we keep doing that. See? Why, 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 why? If all else fails, you're asking that. Why? The question is another moral question. Well, that seems to assume 
that dying out is something we should avoid. Why? Why is that bad? So we can go, let's go down that route. There's other ways you can answer it, but that's a good one. Why is, why is it bad? Why should we preserve life? Another way of asking Carly's question. Why should we, why should we try to preserve life then? How might they answer that? Because people want to live. Okay, yeah. How would you respond to that? Why do people want to live? Well, maybe, but people, they would say, well, it's innate. I mean, we, we want to avoid death. So it might be a better question to ask. We're talking about ethics here. So he says, well, we shouldn't kill, we shouldn't, we should, we should try to preserve life because people desire to live. Does that answer the question of why it's, why we should preserve life, like why it's wrong to kill? Because people don't like it. No. They don't want it to happen to them. Well, why not? I think so, so it's like our instincts. What's that? They would, uh, they would say it's probably like our instincts, like it comes from like evolving, mm-hmm. like we are wired to survive. Sure. Yeah, they would say that. Is that relevant to ethics? Can I help a little bit? I think what we've already seen is somebody jump track a little bit. They jump, jump to something else. They're saying, why should we not kill each other? Why should we preserve life? Well, because people want to live. And it's our innate, instinctual thing to try to preserve ourselves, at least. Okay. Sure. That's true. We want to live and preserve our lives, our own lives, at least. So what? The question is, why is it wrong? Remember the irrelevant thesis fallacy? Yeah. True, perhaps, but <coughs> irrelevant. Okay, yeah, we want to we want to live. People desire their own lives to live. Why should we care what people want? The implication of Raoul's answer is, well, people want to live. Remember the enthymemes? He left out what the implication is, though. And we should just do what people want. Right? Well, people want to live, so let them live. We should just defer to people what they want for themselves. Well, okay, well, why? So we're asking another ethical question. Well, why, why is it that these school shooters should care about what these kids want? Or what these teachers want? Or whatever? Why should we treat people a certain way? We're talking about ethics broadly here. Like, why is it that we should live a certain way? So let's bring it, down, bring it there. Why should we care about what other people want for themselves? Why can't it just be, I'm going to do what I want to do? How might they respond to that? What if they want to do what they want to do? Like the kids and the... the mm-hmm. shoes? I'm sure they do, so what? Why should I care about their desires? I know it's hard to kind of get out of your own worldview. And <laughs> How about this? Okay, <laughs> right. And it might, it might devolve to that at this point as possible, which is what? Why shouldn't you do it? Because you shouldn't. What have they done there? No, I was saying, like, like you said, why, uh, like, why should I care about okay. other people or whatever? It's like, I guess you shouldn't. But that's your point. Okay, and if they say that, then, so they say, well, I guess it doesn't matter what, what we do to each other. So let's bring it back to the first question. Do you think school shootings are wrong? Now I have to say, I guess not. So you, so you reduce their argument to, to that at this point, if, you, if they go that route. Now they've abandoned their first position. So do you think it's wrong for us to do these things? Now you're back to the question, do you believe in ethics? Right? So you don't think it's wrong. We can just do whatever. We don't have to care about other people. And they say, yeah, okay. Then you want to talk about inconsistencies. Are they actually going to live that way? Do they actually believe that in other <laughs> scenarios? It really doesn't matter what we do. Rape, murder, whatever. It all goes. Again, they probably say no. Okay. Let's back it up. So we, let's go, let's, let's say, you go that route, I think you've already done a good job there. 
if we back it up and say, well, why, why should we care about what people want? Back to what you're saying. Well, well they might say, well, we should, we should treat people how we want to be treated. Why? See? That's an ethical statement, too. We should treat people the way we want to be treated. Well, why should we do that? And the answer cannot be, well, because that's just the decent thing to do. Well, that begs the question, doesn't it? That's the whole thing we're asking you. Why is, what is right, what is wrong? Why should we care? Like, why, why does it matter what we do? So they have beliefs in ethics in this scenario that we're talking about. But so far, we haven't gotten an answer as to why it's wrong to murder students in a school. An answer that's not inconsistent or arbitrary, I should say. Other, other answers. What other answers might you get? For why it's wrong? Mm-hmm. Let's just reset and say, okay, we're talking to this person. We agree it's wrong, but why in your worldview is it wrong? Or a school shooting is wrong? Let me throw one out there and you guys can answer it. Well, because it's illegal. How would you respond to that? Okay. <laughs> It's illegal because we recognize that it's wrong. The wise man. Right. So now you're back to right. He's circle around. Well, why is it wrong? Well, because because it's illegal. You're just not allowed to do it. Okay. Has that answered the question? Can you reduce that to absurdity? Show inconsistency. What I'm saying is it's wrong because the government says so. When the government makes it legal, that's what's immoral. So then you're saying the government always does what's right. No. <laughs> See? Is that, so you ask, like, so are you saying that whatever the government says is always right? <laughs> I don't know anybody who's going to say yes to that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's a great, very good. That's exactly it. Okay. <coughs> oh, yeah. So you're saying that, um, well, then you also could do this. What about when the government has flip-flopped? When it's changed its position on things? For example, at one point in this country, it was legal to have slaves. At another point, it's not. So they, it was right? So you're saying that slavery was right. <laughs> okay. You want to be careful with that. Don't become rude. But like, so the, but like saying, well, if that's the case, wouldn't that be what you'd have to say? I'm sure you wouldn't say that, but logically, wouldn't that mean that since the government determined what's right and they said that, that they were right? And if that was the case, then how do you know that what their position now is, is right when they're contradictory positions? Mm-hmm. See the inconsistency? The government cannot, is not a good standard for ethics. Well, this, which government? You know, I mean, you can talk about government over time, the U.S. government over time, but you're also like, well, why, why? So you're just saying it's relative to the country. And they'd probably say, yeah, 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 relative geographically. So if there's a country that says you can kill kids in schools, then it's ethically okay. Well, you know, and then you have, you're reducing it to absurdity. If that's what you're saying, that the country where it's taking place, they determine what's right and wrong. Man, that's, that's a pretty pathetic answer when you show the, all the inconsistencies with it. Um, sometimes, I mean, this is honestly in my experience, it's just my experience, the most common answer is, is just kind of, a regular circle of why is it wrong to kill these school students because that is hurting people. But what do you, how do you respond to that? Why is that wrong? Yeah, why is it wrong to hurt people? Well, well because it, it's causing people pain. Damn the question. It's the same thing, right? They're just rewording it. Well, why is it wrong to cause people pain? <laughs> right? Could do that? Well, because we just, I mean, would you want people to hurt you? What are they implying with that statement? They're saying we should treat people how we want to be treated. Right. Say, so, well, no, but why, why should we treat people the way we want to be treated? Well, because that's just the, the way that we should act towards people. Say, so, okay, but why? <laughs> that's the question. Say, so, well, that's my whole question, really. Why? So you're looking for arbitrariness and inconsistency, and this is just one area of, of human experience is ethics. We all make ethical judgments. Everybody believes things are right and wrong, and we're just asking them, well, why is it right? Or why is it wrong? 
about anything. It doesn't have to be school shootings. It can be any ethical claim. I just picked that as an illustration. Why is it wrong to steal? Or will you agree it's wrong to steal? Or we agree on that? Why is it wrong to steal from your worldview? You give all these bad answers and you say, okay, so have, it, it, it doesn't sound like you've actually given an answer. Do you you, can you think of another reason maybe if they, it'd be wrong? And eventually they might just give up and say, oh, I guess I can't think of anything. So, okay. <coughs> so what about from my world? You know, I'm a Christian. How do you think I'd answer the question? Why it's wrong to do school shootings? And if they know anything about it, they say, well, I guess because God, I guess it says in the Bible that you shouldn't kill people. I think that's right. Because God has revealed that. You know, Ten Commandments, for example, you shall not murder. So in my worldview, I can make sense of why I believe things are right and wrong. I started with that foundation. The Bible is God's word. And from that, I can make sense of why certain things are right and certain things are wrong. I can justify my belief in it. I have a reason to believe it. But from their worldview, you're pointing out, you haven't provided a reason. You have no reason to believe it, but you do. So when it comes to ethics, do they have a rational view or justification of ethics? No, nope. because they have no reason to believe in it. The reasons are either arbitrary, which there's really no reason at all, or they're inconsistent, which is irrational. They're believing in something for no good reason. So when it comes to their worldview with regard to this first precondition for knowledge, ethics, they failed. They can't provide a reason for their belief in ethics. Now let's take it from our worldview. Here's a person who's an atheist who has no reason to believe school shootings are wrong, but yet does believe they're wrong. Why is it that he believes that they're wrong? What's the answer from the Christian worldview? Because God's laws are in our hearts. Yeah. We know why he believes that. But since he denies God's existence, he has, no, he has no reason to believe it in his own worldview. Remember, there's two approaches to the Bible. Either it is God's word or it isn't. And if you start over here that it isn't, you're reduced to foolishness and absurdity when it comes to your beliefs about ethics. You have no reason to believe him. You just do. Right? That's no good, right? This worldview of rationality is no good. But we also know something else. The unbeliever, do they know that God exists? Does the atheist know that God exists? In one sense, yeah. Remember Romans 1? He suppresses it, so he's self-deceived, but he suppresses it. And that's shown by his, the way that he thinks and lives. Although he claims there is no God, he lives in a way that shows that there is, because he does believe in ethics. Well, that doesn't make sense in his worldview. It makes sense from a Christian worldview. So remember, he's... Remember, in order, remember the guy who argues against air but has to breathe air to make the argument? Here's the unbeliever who argues against God but uses stuff from the Christian worldview to do so. Right? He's using ethics, which don't make sense in an atheistic worldview but only makes sense in the Christian worldview. He's pulling from that but yet, argue, but yet arguing from it, arguing against it, I mean. Doesn't make any sense, right? Arguing against God, but using things that come from God. Now he's self deceived; doesn't see that. That's what's really going on, is that suppressing he suppresses the truth. But yet, since his worldview, if, in other words, if atheism were true, there would be no ethics. There's no reason for ethics in an atheistic worldview. There would be no ethics. The problem is there is ethics. That ethics does not grow out of atheism, out of an atheistic worldview. It doesn't logically come from it. It comes from the foundation of the Christian worldview. So when an atheist is making ethical claims, he's not being consistent with his own worldview. He has no reason to make ethical claims, as we've seen. It's just arbitrary and inconsistent. So he's really borrowing from the Christian worldview when he makes ethical claims. Unwittingly, he's doing this. And the reason is because he is made in God's image and he does have the law written on his heart. Even though he denies God, he is still, in fact, in reality, created by him and living in God's world, even though he denies that. So we know why that he believes in ethics. He doesn't, but we do. Um, and that's pretty, I think that's pretty important to recognize, that you can see him suppressing the truth really before your eyes while he believes in ethics but denies God. But ethics doesn't make sense in an atheistic worldview. You following this? Are there questions about that? What if an atheist said something like, well, 
I don't believe the Bible to be true. Um, I think that like men wrote the Bible and then they just took from what was around them. Like, so they took morals from the world around them and then put them into this book. So you're saying that like my morals are incorrect because they're not the Bible, but the Bible. Like, what are they saying that they do believe the morals in the Bible, but not because of the Bible? Right. You know what I mean? Yes. And that's a good, that's a good thing to bring up because people do make that argument. Um, I think it kind of um, misses the, the point and th- misses the thrust of the argument. Um, we can talk about the particulars of what is right and wrong, whether murder or adultery is right and wrong, etc. But we're even talking more basic than that, is that is there a certain way that we should live? Is there a such thing as right and wrong? Um, and if the Bible is simply guys making stuff up and it's on their own authority... Right. This, this, this is the thing, is that we're taking, that's an unbelieving standpoint of the Bible. Because what what, if there's two approaches to the Bible, the Bible is God's word and the Bible isn't God's word. That argument that they made, what side are they on? They don't believe it's God's word. Right. Their view of the Bible is just a bunch of guys, ancient guys who put stuff together, products of their culture. So they're starting over here on the foundation that the Bible is not God's word. If that's the case then you can't make sense of the ethics. This is, they, they still have no reason to believe in ethics, okay? Because they haven't accepted the presupposition that the Bible is God's word. They can't make sense out of the universal object of ethics. So you have people who aren't, who aren't even necessarily atheistic, but who will make that argument who don't believe the Bible. They're saying, well, it's not really God's word. It's just God's. And if that's the case, then there's, there's no reason to view the ethics in the Bible as authoritative. Because it's not God's word. It's no different than if you guys make something up. So it still really hasn't answered the question of why something is right and wrong if you don't believe the Bible is God's word. Am I answering your question? Um, yeah. Can you say, can you say it again? Yeah, well, I'm saying that they do believe the things in the Bible, basically. But they're just saying that these things have always, like, existed and so the people just stole them from like already having existed and then put them into the bible um so like why are you more right than me kind of thing because we're like believing the same thing you're just thinking yeah so this is important so sometimes when it comes to the particulars or the content of our ethical beliefs we will agree with an unbeliever so it's not a matter of, on the issue of, like, theft, we may agree, hey, it's wrong. That's not so much the issue. The issue is, can you give a reason for believing that? So it's not just debating with the unbeliever over something we disagree on, like abortion, that we disagree on that, maybe. That's not the issue here. The issue is, for when we agree on something, it's wrong, school shootings are wrong. The question is, from their worldview, can they give a reason why it's wrong? And that's the issue here, is we're attacking member of the worldview and saying, does your worldview make sense of it? So if you're, they're saying, well, the Bible is just a compilation of ancient cultures, and people are drawing ethics from other cultures' codes of ethics. Say, okay, if that's your worldview, why is it wrong? Same question. Why is it wrong to do school shootings? All they're, all they're really saying is, I don't believe that the words, the ethics of the Bible come from God. Okay, if, that, if that's your worldview, then why is it wrong? And essentially, you're going to get the same, probably the same types of answers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we're not so much debating the particulars of ethics. In fact, it's best to find something that you agree on with the unbeliever, so, we, so it doesn't devolve into that. So pick something that most people would agree on, like school shootings or something like that, or rape or something like that. We agree on that. I, I always wor- I word it this way. Would you agree that it's wrong? So you're already telling them, I think it's wrong. Do you think it's wrong too? And they'll say, of course. The Holocaust was wrong. You say, good, I'm glad we agree on that. That's wonderful. So from your worldview, though, why do you think it's wrong? So now you're not debating whether the Holocaust was wrong. You're, you're questioning whether they can give a reason for it. 
for it being wrong. I mean, a justification for it being wrong. Does that answer your question? Okay. Does that make sense to the rest of you? Yeah? Okay. So remember, we're asking them an epistemological question of can they give a justification for their belief about something ethical? Or do they just believe it just because? And if somebody takes that position that the Bible is just the word of men, although they agree with the content of the ethics in general, like murder is wrong and adultery is wrong, it's really not the word of God, but then they're not justifying ethics in their worldview with that position either because it's just the word of men at that point. And it's, that's no better. Their opinion is no better than the next guy's then. So that would be, I think, missing the point. They may agree with the ethics. Oh, that's, that's cool. That's, that's great. I'm glad we can agree on some of that. But why, from your worldview, if there is no God or if he hasn't revealed himself in Scripture, why is it wrong? Is it, or is it just the opinions of ancient men? Huge difference there, isn't there? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Cool. So that's one of the preconditions of intelligibility. In order for us to make sense out of ethics, which we all have beliefs in about ethics, the, the question is we need, to, we need to ask them is why do you believe that or how do you know that? And then look for our return consistency to see if they can actually answer the question. If not, they're irrationally believing it. They do believe in ethics. So I'm not saying atheists don't believe in ethics. They do. They just believe in it arbitrarily and inconsistently. In other words, they believe in ethics irrationally. It does not make sense in their worldview. But it does make sense in the Christian worldview if, you, if you're starting with the presupposition that the Bible is God's word, I can tell you why it is wrong for these questions. Right? Upon the foundation of the Christian worldview. But if you're on the foundation of the Bible is not God's word, then you're reduced to arbitrariness, inconsistency, irrationality when it comes to ethical claims. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Okay, that same form of argument is going to be true of all of these preconditions for knowledge. Okay, and they get a little bit harder to understand. Um when you first learn them, okay? So let's, let's talk about the next one. We'll call it uniformity of nature, okay? In other words, nature functions in a uniform way, a law-like way. There's consistency in nature. Laws of physics, laws of chemistry, these types of things. Science is possible because nature is, is uniform. We can depend upon the laws of nature being laws in the sense that they function continuously in that way. Does that make sense? So uniformity of nature is. Just as everybody believes in ethics, everybody believes in uniformity of nature. Without even thinking about it, we are all presupposing it at every second of our life. Are you, you're not always thinking about gravity holding everything down, but you presuppose it all the time, right? You're not always wondering, well, I wonder if we'll fly out into space any second now. Will gravity just turn off or switch or the laws of physics just, boom, abandon? Like, we expect everything to still be held down by gravity. We expect the law of gravity to be a thing, right? Without thinking about it, every human being is always thinking that. It gets even more basic, though. The molecular structure of everything. You expect it to stay the same, right? So you expect the chair you're sitting on to be a chair in five seconds, right? You don't expect it to turn into a kitten, do you? And the reason you don't is because you believe in uniformity of nature without even thinking about it. You presuppose it. Nature functions in a law-like way, right? Things stay as they are, and we can depend upon things. We can, we can do science because we have looked at and observed the laws of nature, and we can depend upon them. So if I, um, you know... I have something here. Let's take this. If I am holding the, my Bible and I let it go, oh, it falls to the ground. What happens if I do it again? What do you think? It'll fall. Yeah, look, we're doing science, right? Repeatability. What, what, why do we think it will fall? Because we believe in gravity. 
we believe in the uniformity of nature. Right? Make sense? And this is, this is true about every single second and every little bit of your experience. When you think about it for a little bit, okay, everything around you you're expecting to be held by the laws of nature. You're still going to be a human being from one second to the next because you believe in uniformity of nature. You think, yeah, I'm not going to change into something else. My molecular structure is not going to turn me into a mushroom or something, right? You're going to say, I'm going to be who I am. My car is going to be a car. The floor is going to be the floor, right? It's so basic. And that's why it's a precondition for knowledge. If nature were not uniform, we couldn't know anything. Let's think about that. What if, what, if, what if nature is not uniform and gravity is not dependable? What happens when I let go of this? Do you know? Yeah. You don't know? You know nothing about it. What about this? You put your hand on the hot stove. Ow, burns your hand. How do you know that the next time you do it, it won't be the best experience of your life? Right? If nature is not uniform. Everybody believes it because you need nature is nature being uniform is a precondition for you to know anything. You guys know the this is not an inductive argument, but the inductive principle, which is from some experiences, you can learn about other experiences. So you put your hand on the hot stove, it's a gas stove, there's flame. You burn your hand. But what you learn from that is that if you put your hand on any flame, it'll burn you. Have you experienced all flames? No, maybe just that one, but you know that you put your hand in the fireplace, it's going to be the same type of result, or on the campfire. Inductive principle, one or two examples maybe, and then you can say, well, it applies to all things similar to it. Because nature is uniform. How would you know, well, the, the flame on my mom's stove hurts me. But who knows about the flame on my grandma's stove? Right. Well, nobody thinks that way because we all believe nature is uniform and we believe in the inductive principle. Well, I learned from my mom, though, that the flame's going to hurt me. My gra the grandma flame is going to hurt me too, right? That's the, that's the inductive principle. And that's based upon nature being uniform. So, all this being said, this is why it's a precondition for intelligibility. You couldn't know anything unless nature's uniform. And it's something that everybody believes in, whether they think about it or not. That makes sense? Just like everybody believes in ethics, and they do, everybody believes that nature is uniform. You couldn't function, you couldn't know anything if you didn't. Right? You wouldn't even know that you would, that you would be here from one second to the next, because this whole, this whole thing could fly apart. I mean, every molecular structure of everything in this room, we don't expect that to happen. We expect things to be functional, and we expect science to be possible. To be able to do experiments in the world and have repeatability with those experiments, right? Okay. So why this is this? Why is this important? This is the key question. So we always have an epistemological question. The question is, how do you know that nature will be uniform in the future? That's the the key question. So let's let's give an example. So just like with ethics, how we gave an example of school shootings or something, here we give an example as well to illustrate uniformity of nature. We'll say, how do you know that when I let go of this in five seconds that it'll fall down? How would somebody answer that? Let's take, let's take our atheist again. How, would they, how might they answer that? Because it always has. Bingo. And that's basically the only answer that is given. Every time in the past we've done it, going to happen every time in the future. Okay, so the question is, how do you know that nature will be uniform in the future? And the answer is, essentially, because nature is always uniform. Do you see a problem with that answer? It's uniform because it's uniform. Begs the question. How do you know that nature will be uniform? Well, because nature is always uniform. But also, wouldn't that be like inconsistent? Because they've like they believe that it's from like if they believe in evolution, they believe that it wasn't consistent, right? Like that's not very consistent. They might narrow it and say, well, in all of human experience, it's been 
uniform, which I think they would say, they would agree to that. True, there have been, in that worldview, there would probably propose massive changes in the early parts. Um, but what are you referring to, like the Big Bang? Like that changing? Oh well, yeah, but just like the changing of like animals, people, kind well, of even then. Well, they would probably say that that is part of nature, the uniformity of nature. Uh, and we do, we will see that going forward. Um, so they would say that's just part of the laws of nature. So that's probably how they answer that. But the, the issue is, is the big and the question thing, is that how do you know that nature will be uniform in the future? And you can't just say well, because that's how nature is. It's always uniform. In fact, what's really interesting about this, and this is not just me, some, you know, a Christian guy saying this, um, what's really fascinating is that two, um, two prominent and, and really well-respected atheist philosophers have recognized this issue. Uh, David Hume recognized this, and then and, and, uh, Bertrand Russell as recently as the 20th century. I'm going to read for you um, some things from Bertrand Russell. He wrote a book, um, Problems of Philosophy. And I want you to, it's kind of hard to follow, so I'm going to translate a little bit for you what he's saying. But this is what he's from an atheist. I just want you to recognize that this is something that even the, some of the best atheist philosophers has, have recognized that they don't have a reason to believe that nature will be uniform in the future because they recognize it begs the question. So here's what he said. He said, the problem, we have, the problem we have to discuss is whether there is any reason for believing in what is called the uniformity of nature. Do we have a reason to believe it? He says, the belief in the uniformity of nature is the belief that everything that has happened or will happen is an instance of some general law to which there are no exceptions. So that principle of, inductive, of induction, right? The flame, this flame hurts, all flames. This flame burns me, all flames burn me, type of thing. Okay. It has been argued that we have reason to know that the future will resemble the past. That's the question. How do you know that the future will be uniform like the past has been uniform? Like every time I've dropped the book in the past, it's fallen. That's my past experience. But how do I know that that will be the case in the future? So he says, we know, he says some, people, some people argue that we can know the future will resemble the past, because this is where it gets a little complicated. He says, because what was the future has constantly become the past and has always been found to resemble the past so that we really have experience of the future, namely of times which were formerly future, which we may call past futures. Forget all that. Let me explain what he's saying. <laughs> um, it's like this. <coughs> Let's talk about something basic like the sun rising each morning. Okay. So say it's Monday, and we say, okay, will the sun rise tomorrow? We say, I don't know. Tuesday comes around, the sun rises. So what was future to us on Monday, well, on Tuesday it became past, because it happened. So Tuesday afternoon, we can look back on Tuesday morning and say, the sun rose today. And each day the sun rises. So here we are on Friday, and we ask the question, how do we know the sun will rise tomorrow morning? He says, some people may say, well, it's always been that way in the past. When we thought about it on Monday, looking forward to the future on Tuesday, we said, let's find out. And then it happened. And then same with Tuesday to Wednesday and Wednesday to Thursday and Thursday to Friday. So every time we've looked to the future to see whether it would happen, it has happened. In other words, it'll happen in the future because it's always happened that way. Each time, each day, it's risen. So we can expect it to in the future. He's saying some people answer it that way, that the sun will rise tomorrow because the sun rises every day. Okay? But as we've already seen it, as he'll point out, that, doesn't, that begs a question. All right? So it's like this. He says, but such an argument really begs the very question at issue. We have experience of past futures, Monday going to Tuesday, earlier this week, but not of future futures. That is... What's future to us here on Friday? Yes, we've experienced Tuesday already, which was future to us when we were living on Monday. But here we are on Friday. We haven't experienced Saturday yet. Here, here today, we haven't, right? We haven't experienced the future. He says, we have, we're not future futures. And the question is, will future futures resemble past futures? In other words, will the future tomorrow resemble what, we, what was the future to us on Monday that happened on Tuesday. 
So the question is not to be answered by an argument that starts from past futures alone. So not talking, it shouldn't be answered by saying, well, it happened on Tuesday. We have therefore still to seek for some principle which shall enable us to know that the future will follow the same laws as the past. You hear that? In his book, Problems of Philosophy, he's saying, we still have to seek for some principle which enables us to know that the future will resemble the past. That nature will be uniform in the future. He says that, the, other, the answer that is given begs the question. That's no good answer. It's arbitrary. So he goes on and says, the general principles of science, such as the belief in the reign of law and the belief that every event must have a cause, are as completely dependent upon the inductive principle as are the beliefs of daily life. Right? Every bit of our experience depends upon uniformity of nature, as we discussed a minute ago. He says, all such general principles are believed. This, this, is, this is so interesting to me from an atheist perspective. He says, all such principles are believed because mankind has found innumerable instances of their truth in no instances of their falsehood, but this affords no evidence for their truth in the future unless the adductive principle is assumed. But assumed, but not known. And he says this, he says, Thus, all knowledge, which on the basis of experience tells us something about what is not experienced, like something in the future, is based upon a belief which experience can neither confirm nor confute, and this is where it's interesting, yet which, at least in its more concrete applications, appears to be as firmly rooted in us as many of the facts of experience. He's saying, we don't have a reason to believe it, but it's rooted in us to believe it. Now, in his atheistic worldview, he doesn't make sense of that, but why is it rooted in us? Because every man knows. Yeah, because man knows God, and as we'll look at, at that nine-page outline, talks about this, but God has revealed to us Nature being uniform, he's revealed it in his word, and he has um, expected us to, um, well, he, he, since we can know things, and he has cre- he's created the world in a law-like way, in other words, and he's revealed that to us. We'll leave it at that for now. So he says, the, the existence and justification of such beliefs for the inductive principle, as we shall see, is not the only example that raises some of the most difficult and most debated problems of philosophy. So in other words, basically it's this, he's saying, we don't have a reason to believe that the future will function in a law-like way. We just do. We all do, but we don't have a reason to believe it. I think it's a real big problem. It's a tough one. And he says you can't answer it by saying, well, it's always happened in the past, because that begs the question. The question is, why is nature uniform, or, why w- or will it be uniform in the future? And, y- and they say, yeah, because it's always uniform. Well, that's the very question we're asking. Will it be uniform? Will it be law-like? And they say, yeah, because it's law-like. Because it's a law. Well, see, you see the circularity of it, the begging the question, nature of it. Okay? So this is huge. We're talking about preconditions for knowledge. If you can't know anything, if you can't know that the future will be like the past when it comes to laws of nature, then you can't know anything. Let's think about that for a minute. What do you know about the flame? If, in the future, you don't know that it will burn you. You don't know what will happen. You don't know anything. Nothing about the flame. You're, cause, cause why? Because your past experiences of, of the flame are irrelevant to your future experiences of them. Because you don't know whether the flame will function in the future the way it has in the past. If you can't justify nature being uniform. If you can't give a, a reason for that. Do you follow that? So putting your hand on the hot stove, if you, you don't know the next, next time what it will do to you. So what do you know about putting your hand on the hot stove? Nothing. It could be the best experience of your life. You really don't know. In fact, you don't know anything about... None of you, none of, any, nothing you've learned from experience is relevant. <coughs> the fact that you really don't know anything at all. Say you have a brand new tube of toothpaste and you break the seal on it and you press down on it. What's going to happen? Toothpaste will come out, right? How do you know that? That if you do that tonight, that that will happen? 
Past experience, yeah. And then as Bertrand Russell says, oh, that begs the question. How do you know that it'll happen in the future, that nature is uniform, and that you can base off of former experience of new toothpaste tubes, that you can make a, like a judgment about what will happen with the next one you use? He's saying you can't by just saying, well, it's been that way in the past and nature is uniform. Because that's the very question. How do you know that nature will be uniform? Now, from a Christian worldview, the answer is rather similar to how we answer those ethical questions we talked about before. When I ask you why, is it wrong, why a school shooting is wrong, where do you go? The Bible. And you say, well, because God has said. He has revealed that. Same thing is true of uniformity of nature. How do you know that nature is uniform? God has revealed that nature is uniform. But again, if you're somebody who does not start with the presupposition that the Bible is God's word, you reject that claim, then you have no basis for knowing that nature will be uniform. As the first Henry Russell said, we just, it's rooted in us, we just believe it, but don't have any reason. But if you start with the foundation of God's word, uniformity of nature is made sense of, and therefore knowledge is possible. We can learn from past experiences. Right? We can make sense of, we can justify the belief that flames in the past will have the same effect on my hand in the future. Why? Because God has said nature is uniform. He has, he has revealed that principle to us in Scripture. But if you're somebody who doesn't accept God's word, then you have no basis for saying that nature is uniform. You believe it. Everybody believes it. But just because. Arbitrarily. As Bertrand Russell said, it begs the question, which is an arbitrary fallacy. Do you follow that? I want you to meditate on that a little bit about how much you presuppose uniformity of nature and how if we couldn't know that nature was uniform, how we couldn't really know anything at all. You need to grasp, the more you grasp that, the more you're going to see the potency of this, of this form of argumentation. Remember we talked about before the transcendental argument. We're saying if the Christian worldview must be true because if you reject it, um, you're reduced to irrationality, foolishness, and knowledge is impossible. You see how we're starting to get that direction? We are already there, in fact, so we're going to see more examples of this. But if somebody doesn't accept the Bible as a foundation, as a basic presupposition, as God's word, they can't tell you that they can't actually justify belief in anything because they can't justify belief in uniformity of nature. Think about it. <laughs> from stuff as mundane as toothpaste tubes to putting your hand on the stove to complex quantum physics, all of it depends upon uniformity of nature. Not just scientists in the lab, <coughs> but regular people living their day-to-day -day life. You always, at every second of your existence, presuppose uniformity of nature. The question is, can your worldview give a reason to believe in uniformity of nature? You see that? Same question. Why do you believe that? Or how do you know that nature will be uniform? And the only answer that unbelievers give is a fallacy. Begs the question. Or variations of that. They may even just say it's just the way that it is, but that's pretty clearly, obviously, the same arbitrariness. Does that make sense? Okay, so we've covered two preconditions of intelligibility so far. Ethics, universal objective ethics, and uniformity of nature. They affect, th those things are necessary for us to make sense of our experience as people in the world, to know anything at all. Right? Uniformity of nature is necessary for us to know anything. It's a precondition for knowledge. And that's why it's called that. Because it, you need to have uniformity of nature in order for us to know anything. The question is, can, can your worldview justify belief in that precondition of intelligibility? Am I making myself clear? Do atheists believe in uniformity of nature? Do they believe in the preconditions of intelligibility? Absolutely. The question is, can their worldview justify that belief? Do they have good reasons for that belief? Or do they just believe it arbitrarily and or inconsistently? 
So what we're showing is, if you start with the, with the foundation of the Bible being God's word, well, then you can make sense out of knowledge. You can explain why knowledge is possible. With ethics, because God has revealed ethics. With uniform nature, because God has revealed that his creation is uniform. And like I said, that nine-page handout goes through some biblical verses to show that in Scripture, so you know where you could go. We'll talk about that uh, next time. That's the plan, at least. Um, so we've talked about two preconditions for knowledge, and so far, when we talked about the atheist here, for example, he, he can't answer them without committing fallacies. So if you start with the Bible as God's word, you can make sense out of how knowledge is possible, how we can know anything at all. But what we're showing is if you don't start there, your worldview is foolish. You can't make sense out of anything. You can't even claim to really know anything on, on your worldview's foundation because you can't make sense of why knowledge is even possible in the first place. You, you following this? I mean, how do you even know, like... You, because the point is, if, if, if you can't prove that you, nature is uniform, then you can't show anything scientifically. Science is impossible without you know, na nature being uniform. Because maybe you've done an experiment in the past, put baking soda and vinegar together and it fizzed up. Well, okay, that happened in the past, but who knows what will happen the next time we do it if nature is not uniform. Now, again, they believe nature is uniform, but do they have a reason to believe it? No. And as Bertrand Russell admitted, they don't have a reason. It's a tough question from his worldview. It's, in fact, I would say an impossible question in his worldview, one he cannot answer. So it all comes down to what we presuppose. We're going to pre presuppose God's word. If we start with the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of knowledge. So we have to start there. That has to be our starting point for us to know anything at all. Now, why is it that the unbeliever can do science, even though he can't justify belief in uniformity of nature? Why does the unbeliever do science and can actually be successful in doing medicine and things like that? Why is that? He's, it doesn't make sense in his atheistic worldview, for our example, but is he living in an atheist universe? No. He's living in what? God's yeah. And he's creating God's image and he's able to function in this world because although he can't give a reason to believe in it, he does believe in uniformity of nature and therefore does do science and that can actually do well in it in certain cases. But his world, it doesn't make sense in his worldview. Just like the guy can be, have pretty good ethics, he's an atheist, he can be opposed to all the right things but have no reason to be opposed to them. Likewise, a guy can do science, but have no basis for it in his worldview. You following this? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. All right, um, we won't. We'll stop there for for questions before we wrap up. We have a few minutes. So, questions. What's a good scripture like to uh, explain like you know, the full nature? Oh, I can't. Yeah, look on. It's like probably the second or third page. It's on page three or nine. Yeah. We'll go over these next time, Lord willing. I guess the plan is to get through some other ones, and then we'll talk about the biblical justification for them. Ethics is pretty easy. That's the first one. You get the law of God and stuff. Uniformity of nature is, um, as you can see from some of those verses, is applied in various ways, like the sun rising, which I think was actually David Hume's example, is that he didn't, couldn't justify the sun rising tomorrow. But the Bible does tell us that. Genesis, Genesis 8, 22 is kind of a good go-to. Day and night, sea time and harvest, cold and heat will not cease. So that cycle that he's saying, so these are going to go on. So we know that, how do we know that night will come today? Well, from an atheistic worldview, there really is no reason to believe that. But from our world, you can say, because God has said, day and night will not cease, for example. So we have these principles of, of God and being the creator, putting this, uh, this creation to function in a law-like way. Um, so he's revealed that, and therefore we can, since our worldview is based, our, our ultimate authority in the Christian worldview is God's word. We can go there and say, look, this makes sense upon our worldview foundation. 
That make sense? So if you presuppose God's word, you can make sense of it. If you don't, you can't. So other other questions? You've probably been over this before, but what would your answer be for someone saying, why should I trust the Bible? In what sense, like, trusted as God's... What's their position? As, like, a source of how you should do things. Because if we keep going back to the Bible as a reference, and someone says, why do you trust the Bible? We have to go back to the Bible. Yes. Yeah. Why we trust it. Right. So I was... Yeah, and, th- and this is part of the transcendental argument. Because what we're saying is, if you ch- if you don't trust the Bible as God's word, then knowledge would be impossible, and we couldn't even be having this discussion. Mm-hmm. Because if you reject the Bible as God's word, it undermines us being able to know anything at all. Okay. So it's an indirect proof. That's why it's by the impossibility of it being false. The Bible ha- the Bible has to be God's word, because if it wasn't, there's no reason to to believe in uniformity of nature, for example. There's really no way for us to know anything at all. So as I, I think I said to you in the beginning, maybe, that what we're doing is that we're showing, we're going to bring the person to the point of saying, okay, either the Bible is God's word or <coughs> knowledge is impossible. But wait a second. That second option isn't really an option, is it? Because what if they choose that option? Knowledge is impossible. What's the problem with it? They're using it it's a knowledge claim. So it's self-refuting. So you bring them down to those two options, but really it leads to the one. The Bible must be the word of God, um, or else knowledge is impossible. Knowledge is not impossible, therefore the Bible is the word of God. Um, so that would be the. So there's no other. There is no other way to make sense out of knowledge itself. So you couldn't be debating with me right now. That's the funny thing about it is that the the atheist, for example, has to. He can't make sense out of knowledge, but then he. You know, kind of steals from the Christian worldview to argue against it. He's breathing air to argue against it. He's presupposing God by by suppressing that to argue against God. As Van Til put it, it's like a kid who climbs up on his daddy's lap to slap him in the face. Well, he needs his lap to be able to reach him. And that's what the unbeliever is doing. We take some of God's stuff that only makes sense from the biblical Christian worldview and then to argue against the Christian worldview. It doesn't make sense, like breathing air to argue against air. Does that make sense? Okay, well, we'll hopefully that will become clearer over time. This is, this is something that like, we have to frame our thinking and say, okay, this is a different way of arguing, but once we get the hang of it, I'm going to teach you how to explain it to an unbeliever. Because you, don't want, you, know, you, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is kind of deep. How am I supposed to bring this down to the, a street level and be able to talk to somebody so they know what I'm talking about um, and actually use it? And I'll explain that, um, and, and you can try to explain it in the most simple terms so that people can understand what you're saying. Okay, other questions? Yeah? We good? Okay, so next time we're going to continue on talking about the preconditions for knowledge. We have, like, how many more? Three more, I think, maybe four. Um, yeah, and we'll talk about those and those issues, and then we'll go through the biblical... Um, justification for all of them. And that'll probably be what we'll cover next time. That's quite a bit to cover. But think about these things. Look over um, the little cheat sheet that was handed out and um, read the book. Jason Lyle goes over this stuff and it would be good for you to get it not only from my way of explaining it, but from his way of explaining it too. Um, So keep on reading that. And you'll get you'll get to this this stuff throughout it. He does a good job teaching it. So, any other questions? We good. Okay. Let's go ahead and pray them. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for uh, revealing yourself therein, and that um, that uh, starting with you, the fear of the Lord is truly the beginning of knowledge and of wisdom, and that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. And that we have to go to him in order to make sense out of anything at all. And we, we just thank you for um, revealing yourself to us. And we thank you for sending Christ to, to, uh, to save us, to die on the cross for us, that we may be forgiven. And, and we just pray that you'll help us 
as we um, try to learn how to defend the Christian worldview against anybody, that you'll help us to understand these things, as it's it can be challenging to grasp when we first are learning them, but we just pray that you'll help help all, everyone in here to get them, help us to grow in it, and then most especially to use this um, in an effective way in the real world as people bring up different arguments against the Christian worldview. And um, pray that you'll help us to be effective in evangelism as well, and that you'll use us um, and keep bringing the gospel to people to save those people. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you.